book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 16, and we're going to take a little trip to the city of Philippi. Where is Philippi? Well, it's in Greece. It's in the area of Greece called Macedonia. And in Acts chapter 16, the Holy Spirit had prevented Paul and other missionaries from going into certain parts of Asia. And so Paul had a vision in the night of a man in Macedonia who said, come over and help us in Macedonia. And so Paul took that as God's sign to go over into Greece, uh, the first missionary contact for the Christian church in Europe. And so uh, they, they got into Philippi. Philippi is uh, a very important city because it was named after the father of Alexander the Great, Philip II, the Macedonian. And uh, it was an important city for him because it had gold mines. Any, any city that has gold mines, of course, you'd really like to have. So you can see the relationship of Greece and Italy and Turkey. And Philippi is on that east-west trade route that takes you from Europe all the way over to China. The Via Ignatia. And uh, so if you'll change the slide, this is the scripture. Acts 16, 16 through 31, plus a little bit more. And it says it's about the jailer and two of his prisoners. Now it happened after Lydia and her family had become Christians, as we, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, went to prayer in Philippi, that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination of a python, I'll come back to that, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out. Came out that very hour, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace to the authorities, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. And the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded that they be beaten with rods. And when they laid many stripes on them, and I can't see behind the cross, uh, they put them in jail, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such, he took them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now can you imagine? The Holy Spirit directed Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke to go to Philippi. They go to Philippi, they meet on the side of a river with Lydia and a group of women. Lydia comes to faith along with her household. And then they go into the city, the city that the Lord had told them to go to, and they're being uh, stalked by this slave girl. And uh, the Bible translates it as spirit of divination, but when you look at the Greek, it says the spirit of a python. And the reason it says that is because the python was the serpent that guarded the Oracle of Delphi, which was where, which was one of the sacred sites of the Greeks, where they felt like they heard from the gods, and the God gave them God's truth. And the serpent guarded that. And so she uh, was a fortune teller, and they marketed her as someone who could tell the fortunes as if you were at the Oracle of Delphi. And so she followed Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke around town, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they proclaim to us the way of salvation. But Paul wasn't too enamored with this because we don't really need publicity by a girl who's possessed with the spirit of a python, an evil spirit, an idolatrous spirit. And so after several days, Paul being annoyed, he turned to the spirit and said, come out of her. And it happened, just like Paul had commanded in the name of Jesus. And so the two men, her so-called lords, her so-called masters, they were upset because now their way of making money is gone. And because their way of making money is gone, it says they brought Paul and Silas, because Paul and Silas were the leaders. Timothy and Luke were not Jews. Timothy and Luke were Gentiles. And so uh, they're not dragged to the authorities, but Paul and Silas being Jews are. And without a trial, without due process, without questioning, without anything, the magistrates strip them of their clothes, tell them that they're going to be beaten, they're beaten with many lashes, and then they're thrown into a Philippian jail, and their arms and legs are put in stocks where they're going to spend the night. Apparently, the idea was they would spend the night, and then the next day, they would have the real trial. 
the real punishment for these folks disturbing the peace of sweet little Philippi. So if you'll change the slide, Philippi is in ruins today, and you can go to it if you want to, uh, but it had a Roman forum where cases were tried, and it was also the Agora where the marketplace was. You can see in the upper left, uh, it says Paul's jail. So just off of the Via Ignatia was where Paul's jail cell was. And uh, you can go and see all of this stuff. Now, all the houses and stuff are, would, would be around the central city. This is simply the ruins of the central city. Next slide. Here's what it looks like today. This is the, the road through uh, the middle of the city and the colonnade on the left separates the Roman Forum uh, from the edge of the highway. Next slide. On the left is the Philippian jail. And uh, you see the entrance, it's kind of like a cave. And then once you go inside the entrance, if you go down a flight, you're in the inner room, which is where Paul and Silas were held. And then on the right, you see the, the foundations, basically, of what's left of the buildings uh, after it's been 2,000 years. Next slide. This is what the stops look like. An artist rendering, and of course, he's got clothes on. You remember Paul and Silas were stripped of their clothes, and then their legs and their arms are in stocks. The, the Romans like to spread the legs as far apart as possible, and spread the arms as far apart as possible, and stretch the torso as long as possible in order to inflict maximum pain. And so this is how Paul and Silas, or something close to how Paul and Silas were, were supposed to spend the night, on the ground in the Philippian jail. Next slide. This is what happened at midnight. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the jailer, awakened from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light. He ran in. He fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out. I mean, he brought them out from that dungeon that was a floor below the rest of the jail and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And he took them and he washed their stripes. He set food before them. He rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. So here's the scripture. A jailer and two of his prisoners... In Philippi, the town that needed a church, and Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy were sent there to plant one. And this is what happened. First, they're persecuted because they cast out a demon. Then they're in jail. And then there's a miracle. And then there's a jailer who asked how he can be saved. All amazing. So let's look at this scripture and think about how it might apply to us. Next slide, please. So there's two tests in a single day and night. So I didn't fill in the blanks because y'all are going to fill in the blanks. We talk a lot about tests in the Bible. God is always testing us. God sends situations our way to test our faith. Why does God test our faith, John? So that we'll have good faith muscles. That's why we exercise our, our physical body so we have physical muscles. We exercise our faith so we have spiritual muscles. So our faith is vital and alive and growing and maturing and strong. And so God sends situations, circumstances, people, uh, events in our life, and they come in as a form of a test. And how we respond to them is whether we pass the test or whether we fail the test. If we respond to the test in faith, we pass the test. If we respond to the test in fear, in doubt, in insecurity, trying to rely on ourselves or trying to rely on our wits or flying by the seat of our pants and not in faith, we fail the test. And when we fail the test, bad things begin to happen and we have to repeat and take remedial courses. This is how God works. He gives the test first and then he gives the course later. It's a little bit different than how we did it in school. They give the course first and then you get the test at the end. God doesn't work that way. Wouldn't it be nice if God worked that way? God says, okay, Chris, this is what's going to happen to you tomorrow, and this is how I need you to respond. Here's a whole bunch of Bible verses you need to read before tomorrow happens. And then Chris reads it all. He goes, okay, I got it. And then tomorrow, all you know what breaks loose. And Chris goes, oh, well, I know exactly what to do. This is what 
of those Romans 8, 28 situations, so I'll just handle it. That is not how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit works this way. All you know what breaks loose, and you don't know why. But the Holy Spirit is saying, do you trust me in this? Will you go with me in this? Will you let me lead you through this? You know, like Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear to evil, for thou art with me. Do you believe that God is with you today? So this is the test. Now, there were two tests that happened in, the, in Philippi in a single day. There was a test of two individuals that were there for mission work. Who were they? Paul and Silas. And then there was a test for somebody else. Who do you suppose that would have been a test for? A Philippian jailer. Okay, so let's look at those two tests. Paul and Silas sent by God to Philippi. And you know what happens to them? First, they're stopped by a slave girl with the spirit of a python, an idolatrous evil spirit, who is saying, who's giving Jesus uh, publicity as if Jesus was somehow in league with the devil. That's the first thing. The next thing that happens is when they cast out that evil spirit, doing that girl some good, they get thrown in jail for that. Not only do they get thrown in jail for that, but they lose their clothes and they get, oh, about 30 or 40 stripes on their back. Then they're put into prison, which, not like our prisons that are, you know, air conditioned and stuff like that. They get thrown into a prison that's made out of rocks and has a dirt floor, and they're put in stocks where they have to spend the night in pain and torture. Uh, God, is this what you really wanted? That's the test. Do you trust that the Lord has sent you to Philippi after all this has happened? Is, does God owe you if he sends you somewhere for everything to be easy? So how do Paul and Silas respond to the test? What did they do? What did the scripture say they did? They prayed and sang. So I think maybe they passed the test. They were trusting that somehow... God was in this, and if they responded in faith, somehow it was all going to work out. They did not know how it was going to work out, but they knew it was going to work out. Now let's focus on the guy that wasn't a Christian, the guy that wasn't saved, the Philippian jailer. He gets a test too. What does his test look like? Say that again. Yes, that's part of the test. Well, the first thing that happens to the Philippian jailer is he has a day unlike any other day. Like, Philippi was just a nice town. People were behaving. The jail was a packed full of criminals. And all of a sudden, these two guys with the slave girl who, who does fortune telling come into town, and then these four preachers who came from uh, Jerusalem and Antioch, they come into town and they start preaching and teaching. And then everybody's in an uproar all of a sudden. And then, I'm, and then I'm the jailer and I get called to the magistrate's office. Hey, these guys are disturbing the peace. I need you to flog them and flog them and flog them after you're taking all their clothes off and then I need you to take them back to the jail. And he's like, well, what happened? And so they explained him, what happened? He's like, man, nothing like this has ever happened in Philippi before. So he has to put them in the inner cell for you know maximum security because you know they're going to get tried tomorrow. We don't want them to escape because if they escape, then the Philippian jailer uh, he has to lose his life because he lost a prisoner. So he goes to sleep at night thinking, "Man, what a crazy day this was!" And in the middle of the night, Rip, what does he hear? No, he hears songs, and then. Uh, <laughs>
So, special purpose earthquake. This is an earthquake that is specifically focused on stocks, chains, and doors. Walls stay intact. Roofs stay intact. The building stays intact. But the walls and the roof, they don't crumble into ruins. It says that there was an earthquake in the middle of the night and their stocks were loose, their chains were loose. Is that right, Rick? Is that what it says? <laughs> and the doors were open. <laughs> wow. So the jailer's like, what in the world is happening? This is such a crazy day. It's a test. It's all, it's all from God, and it's a test from him, for him. Just like it was a test for Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas, do you trust me? And the Philippian jailer, he's starting to get a message from the Lord. Hey, there's something bigger, different, unusual going on here that you need to pay attention to, Philippian jailer. And so he thinks to himself, this is the worst day of my life. The prison doors are open. The chains are off the prisoners. They are escaping. And I will get tomorrow the sentence of every prisoner that has escaped. And it won't be an easy sentence. Because the Romans like to inflict maximum pain in maximum amount of time. So he draws his sword and says, okay. Uh, and Brian, if you need to, you can move those garbage cans and shut the double doors in. And so he draws his sword because he's not looking forward to the prospect of the next day having lost all of his business. So he's just about to plunge the sword into his chest or fall on it or cut off his head or something like that when Paul calls from the inner cell, the dungeon, and he says, Hey, jailer, we're all here. We didn't run away. We didn't escape. Not just Paul and Silas are here, but we are all here. Everybody is still in the jail. And that's when the jailer starts to put together the pieces of the different things that happened to him and realizing, oh my goodness, I don't have two ordinary prisoners here. I have two servants of the Most High God who can explain the way of salvation in our little town of Philippi. And so he runs to Paul and Silas and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas didn't say, Well, get us out of here as soon as possible and don't tell anybody we escaped. They didn't say that. They're perfectly comfortable being in the middle of God's plan. And so they say, believe on the name of Jesus Christ, you and your household. Now that's, Luke gives us the shorthand version. There's a whole lot more going on there than just uh, those four or five words. And the scripture goes on to say that he believes. Not only does he believe, but he does those things that show he believes. He takes Paul and Silas and he dresses their wounds. That's something he didn't do the previous day. He takes Paul and Silas and he gives them some food. That's something that he didn't do the previous day. And he takes Paul and Silas into his home. He welcomes them because now he's a brother in Christ. And these two are brothers in Christ. Wow. Two texts. Both of them, they responded in faith. Praise God. The next thing. Two miracles simultaneously. We got into that. The first miracle is that Paul and Silas have faith in the midst of their really drastic circumstances. That's a miracle. Faith is a miracle. Now, faith is also a faculty. Faith is also a spiritual gift. But having faith in the midst of the worst day of your life is a miracle. And Paul and Silas experienced that miracle. The other miracle, of course, was there was an earthquake. Not just an ordinary earthquake. A special purpose, specially targeted earthquake. Wow. And then there was the third miracle, which was the jailer's faith. So in this particular scripture, in Acts chapter 16, there's two, two uh, tests of faith and three miracles and all kinds of circumstances. So what do we make of all of this? Let's go to the next slide. The persecution of Christians. That's what Paul and Silas were experiencing. Does persecution come from God? Or does persecution come from the devil? So let's look at that particular scripture, Acts chapter 16. 
How was it that Paul and Silas ended up in jail? Who took them from wherever they were preaching and teaching to the judge to be sentenced? Who took them? Anybody remember? The two guys that owned the slave girl. It says they dragged Paul and Silas to the magistrate and said, these guys are disturbing the peace. These guys are teaching false things. These guys are messing up our city. And the magistrates just said, oh, well, okay. We'll just take your word for it. We're not going to do any questioning or in, 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 uh, interrogation. We'll just take your word for it. And we'll beat them and flog them and strip them and send them to jail. Was that God's doing or was that the devil's doing? I'm not asking you to answer that, but that is a valid question. Because sometimes in the scripture, when bad things happen to believers, it's because God is doing it. And sometimes in the scripture, when bad things happen to believers, it's because the devil is doing it. And you need to pay attention to that. In this particular scripture, it doesn't say who the source is. But it does, it does give us an idea of what does persecution accomplish when you hear about it in the Bible. For example, shortly before Acts chapter 16, a great persecution arose in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem was under attack by the governmental authorities, which were Jewish governmental authorities. What happened to the church in Jerusalem when it faced persecution? Anybody remember? It dispersed. The Christians... A lot of them in that church in Jerusalem that had thousands and thousands and thousands of members, some of those thousands and thousands and thousands left Jerusalem and went to other cities. And Antioch in Syria became the lead church, no longer Jerusalem. Good things happened because the church got persecuted. And that's been the story of the church in every single age, every single century. The more pressure gets put on the church, the more martyrs that get killed, the, the more difficulties the church faces, the church expands. The kingdom of God goes forward. Good things happen when there's persecution. How should we then pray? Should we pray that God would not allow persecution to ever happen to us? Should we pray that God would give us persecution? No, we don't invite that. What we pray is that we will be faithful no matter what. Whatever befall, God has taught me to say it as well and as well as myself. That's the test. Are you and I going to be the kind of Christians that no matter what we face, how hard it is, how difficult it is, how impossible it seems, what an awful thing that's happening to us is, will we have faith and keep going forward like Paul and Silas? And sing songs in the night, even though we're in pain. What the Bible teaches is, when we experience persecution because we were doing God's will, when we experience persecution because we were following what the Lord wanted us to do, like Paul and Silas were following what the Lord wanted them to do, going to Philippi, when we experience persecution like Paul and Silas did, doing God's will, doing good things, and persecution befalls us, God does three things with that. The first is, sometimes God evacuates us out of the situation. You may remember a story in Acts. Peter is arrested for preaching the name of Jesus. And in the middle of the night, an angel comes. And the angel uh, unlooses his chains and opens all the prison doors of Jerusalem. And Peter walks out free. Sometimes, when we experience persecution, God will actually evacuate us out of the situation and we don't have to have it anymore. That doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. Another thing God does when we experience persecution is He enables us to bear it. This is uh, that verse of Scripture, uh, 2 Corinthians, where Paul says, My grace is sufficient for thee. God will give you grace in every situation where you trust Him. And the grace will be in proportion to the difficulty of your situation if you trust Him. And if you're under intense persecution, God will give you intense grace. If you're under harrowing circumstances, God will give you grace to endure the harrowing situation to the extent of the persecution you may face. The hostility, the antagonism, the regret, whatever it is. God will enable the person that He has called and He is directed by the power of the Holy Spirit to bear up underneath whatever the strain is. 
And then sometimes God will say, well, we'll let this persecution just let you go on to get promoted to heaven. There is another aspect of persecution. Sometimes, let's just, let's just use an example. Back on you years ago. Let's say you went on a mission trip to some foreign country and they knew that you were a Christian and some people in that foreign country specifically targeted you because you were a Christian, because you were doing something good in that country for the Lord. Sometimes the persecution that happens to a Christian is to build that Christian's faith. <coughs> Sometimes the purpose of the persecution that happens to the Christian is for somebody else to see what that Christian is doing and how they're responding to their difficult situation, and it's to build their faith. Sometimes the things that happen to you and the things that happen to me really isn't about me. Really isn't about you. It's that God is doing something for somebody else. And that somebody else has been placed in your life to watch you go through this difficult thing. That's another aspect of persecution. Next slide. In America, we don't get persecuted very much. There's a couple of sins in the American church that are long-standing which go along with why the American church doesn't get persecuted very much. We'll go, go through the first one first. It's the sin of rapturitis. You go, what in the world is rapturitis? Sounds like a disease. Yes, it is a disease. <laughs> rapturitis works like this. You become a Christian. I become a Christian. I love being a Christian. And I love being around my Christian friends. And I love going to church. And I love going to Flint River Chapel. And I love the Christian fellowship that I enjoy. And I love reading my Bible. And I just can't wait for the rapture to occur. I'm just going to go to church. And I'm going to hang around with my Christian friends. And I'm going to be a Christian in my Christian circle. And Jesus is going to take me home someday. Why is that sinful? What's the sin in that church? Yeah, right, you never got out of the four walls of the church and did anything for the Lord. You're just waiting for the rapture in your chair. I'm not saying you are, but that's what that Christian does. <laughs> They're like, I don't want to go out in the world. Those people are scary. Those people are unsaved. Those people are mean. Those people treat you bad. I'm going to stay right here in my Christian circle where everybody's nice. And I can be nice. And we'll just all be hunky-dory and we'll pray for the rapture. There's another sin that's been long-standing in the church. It's called the sin of easy believism. And this plays into persecution too. The first one plays into first the persecution because you never leave. So there isn't anybody, there isn't any, any encounters that you'll ever have that'll be persecution type encounters because you're only socializing with Christians. Easy believism goes like this. You ever been in a worship service and the pastor said, okay, everyone bow your heads. Everybody bows their heads. And he says, uh, anyone that wants to take Jesus as their Savior, just slip your hand up and slip it right back down. And you've got your head bowed and the pastor says, oh, I see that hand. Oh, I see that hand. Oh, I see that hand and that hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then he says a prayer or some sort of thing. And then everybody opens their eyes and you sing the hymn and the pastor says, oh, we just thank God for all the new Christians who raised their hand. And then there's not any follow-up. Discipleship, mission training, Bible teaching, helping whoever it was that raised their hand grow as a Christian, helping whoever raised their hand learn a little bit more about Jesus Christ in that one sermon that they heard. Sometimes it even extends into the worship services because then that new Christian who raised their hand, yes, I believe in Jesus, then they come to the next worship service and everybody's singing and raising their hands. And they think that all you got to do to be a Christian is raise your hand. That's all you got to do. What's the sin in that? The same one. You didn't ever go outside. You think that Christian, or I think, or whoever has this mindset thinks that Christianity is just so simple and so easy and feels so good, just like raising my hand. Philippians 
2.15, remember, we're, we're in Philippi, so Paul's writing a letter back to the church of Philippi in Philippians 2.15, and he says, Be children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and per perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. If you never get out of the church, and if you never leave your Christian friends, you will never shine as a light in the world. Yes, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. It's only those who are not of the world, but who are involved and engaged with, with sleeves rolled up, working for Jesus, with this world. Those are the only ones that get persecuted because they are the ones who are going outside the walls of the church. That's why they get persecuted. But you know if you've got rapturitis, there is a believer. It just might be, folks, that the church has had rapturitis for so long, and there's so many folks in the American church who are easy believers of folks who think that Christianity is just raising your hand, and that's about it. They're like, uh, yeah, have you seen those pictures of Noah's Ark? Where the rain is coming down, and there's the ark floating on the water, and all the doors are shut, and all the windows are closed, and you know that Noah and his family are safe on the ark, and then you see the waters, and there's all these people drowning outside. That's a picture sometimes of the American church. We're all happy inside our four walls, and we got the doors shut and the windows shut, and meanwhile there's a world outside that's just drowning. But we're so happy we're inside our church. We're not shining as lights in the world. We're not working for Jesus and rolling up our sleeves and getting out there. Now, if, if you happen not to be retired and you're still in the work world, uh, you, have, you have a discipline about you where you have to get engaged with the world. You're dealing with people of different cultures and races and religions and all of that stuff if you have a job that requires you to go to work. But if you happen to be retired, you know, you can kind of live it through your social contacts all. Unless you have to go to Walmart. If you have to go to Walmart. <laughs> Give me a minute. You'll, you'll see it all there. So one of the responses to this kind of mindset is, you know what? I need to get out more. You know what? I need to get involved with some people that aren't just exactly like me. I need to be listening to the Holy Spirit like Paul and Silas. Because the Holy Spirit's probably going to send me somewhere where I'm going to be uncomfortable. I'm not going to be in my comfort zone. And I just might be the kind of person that somebody out there is out to get. What happened, at the, what happened in Philippi? Lydia became a Christian. She and her household. The Philippian jailer became a Christian. He and his household. Two families. And they started the Philippian church. A.D. about 56. <laughs> that church. And Paul went there two or three more times and wrote letters back to the church of Philippi because it flourished in the midst of Gentile persecution. That should encourage us. If we get out and we do what the Holy Spirit leads us to do, Christianity will flourish, the church will flourish because that's what God wants us to do. And every time there's persecution, the church thrives. It doesn't, get, it doesn't die. It thrives. Let's go to the next slide. This is a collection of things that the fathers of our faith said about persecution. Jesus said, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. John 15, 20, Matthew 5, 10. Paul wrote a whole lot about persecution. I only got this one. All who desire to live by the lives of Christ will suffer persecution. James, half-brother of Jesus, says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith makes you complete, lack of nothing. Peter, the lead apostle, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering. And then John says in the book of Revelation, Do not fear what you are about to suffer, that you may be tested. So be faithful unto death, and Jesus will give you the crown of life. You put all that together, and what do you have? 
It's the normal Christian life to expect persecution and to have it. It's the normal Christian life to be tested in this way. And it's the normal Christian life for us who experience it and are tested by it to say, Lord, I'm responding in faith. Thy will be done. Whatever you want, whatever brings you the most glory, I realize I'm expendable. Next slide. Persecution is guaranteed to happen if you get outside the four walls of the church. Persecution is guaranteed to test you if you get outside the four walls of the church. And persecution is guaranteed to make you a better witness to Jesus Christ. Here's a verse. Acts 1 8. We all know that verse. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the most part of the earth. That word witnesses. You know what that word witnesses is? If you go back to the Greek, witnesses is the Greek word martyro, from which we get the English word martyr. Jesus says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my martyrs. Living martyrs. Today, the American church finds itself living in a culture and a society that's like Babylon. It's like we somehow moved to ancient Persia, where Christians seem to be in the minority, where God-fearing people seem to be mocked, where God-fearing people get canceled. Where are all the Esthers for today? Where are the Daniels for today? Where are the Shadrachs and the Meshachs and the Abednegoes for today? They're going to be those living martyrs who actually take the Bible seriously and get outside the four walls of the church and obey the Holy Spirit and accomplish things for Jesus Christ. Next slide. Let us pray. Now, I want you to know uh, as we pray that we're going to sing the closing song of Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And if I can get Tom to get our pianist to the piano to help us play Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, we're going to pray while he does that. And what I want you to pray is I just want you to think about how about getting outside the four walls of the church? In what ways are you doing that? And as you do that, we're going to pray. Yes, how wonderful. How wonderful. He's got the gift of music, so that's why I want him to play for us. Now, if you'll bow your heads, let us pray about the whole subject of persecution. Heavenly Father, I confess I've been guilty of rapturitis. I confess I've been guilty of easy believism. I confess that it makes me uncomfortable to go outside the four walls of the church and deal with perfect strangers who might reject me, mock me, make fun of me. It's happened before. It was uncomfortable and I don't want it to happen again. But, I, but even more than that, Heavenly Father, I want to obey the Holy Spirit. I want to glorify the Holy Spirit. I want you to work in my life and test me so that I can grow strong in the faith and not simply vegetate and wait for the rapture. Help us, Heavenly Father, as the American church, as you shake us up, to help us see that there's a world out there that we need to engage in. Help us, Heavenly Father, but forgive us of our sins. And as we sing this song, Heavenly Father, let the word sink deep that Jesus Christ our precious possession is ours, and we can share it with the world. Help us as we do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. we got three verses of blessed assurance. If you'll stand, this is our closing song. Our, on the very last verse, uh, I encourage you to hold hands, and let's sing it to the Lord, and, and raise our hands when we get to those courses.